Hi. Uh, today I will interview a composer from uh, from Australia, Fiona Hill. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Sandra. It's lovely to meet you. <laughs> and uh, maybe you can shortly introduce yourself. Uh, sure. So I'm obviously a composer in Australia. I live in the Blue Mountains, which is a pretty incredible part of the world to live in. Um, I am a mum of two kids so that while I'm not composing that keeps me busy and I mostly write electroacoustic music that's my main focus and integrating technology with acoustic instruments and really exploring kind of the new sound worlds that that are possible by joining those two forces together and just constantly exploring the, the new pathways that are available as a composer in, in the electroacoustic sphere. I find it really fascinating and a, and a lifelong journey. So that's my, my main passion in terms of composing. And um, what is a good musical composition for you? How you, how you would describe? Um, for me, like as a, as a listener, a good musical composition for me is something that has a thread that I can always follow. So whether um, I do listen really widely to, to a, a wide, really wide range of music, but for me, there's a, there's a perfect balance between complexity and simplicity that, that really, for me, great composers achieve. So there's enough interest and layers and textures in there to, to keep me interested, but not so much going on that I can't kind of follow a line or a thread through the music and connect everything together. So, so for me, that that's probably the most important thing from a musical standpoint. And then I'm also really interested in, I guess, dramaturgical or um, kind of extra musical ideas behind, behind music. I find that a really interesting and fascinating thing that a lot of composers bring to their work. And, um... What is your musical, let's say, style or signature? If you need, if you would uh, need to to uh, to describe your language, your musical language to others. Yeah, I think it's always hard describing <laughs> your own your own music, but uh, the 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 main thing that I'm quite obsessed with at the moment is texture, and how that translates in a musical sense. So uh, what how sounds and uh, I'm very influenced by nature and textures in nature and layers and how the world interacts with each other so in in my music I'm really interested with that so how do the instruments interact with each other or or bounce off each other or work against each other or with each other and that often disparate ideas that when they're put together form something really interesting that has a complexity to it but also feels like it kind of fits I guess like that's you know if I'm out often I'll go out and kind of sit in sit in the bush or whatever and you'll still be able to hear the highway or, or motorbikes but it's still part of the environment so I'm really fascinated by that these incongruent or seemingly incongruent things that, that are still exist together in the natural world and so I, I like to find those, that's an inspiration for me in, as far as musical ideas. And so I might often put something that's quite abrasive or suddenly comes out of nowhere. And how does that work with what else is going on in sound and how do these things all, all kind of fit together? So um, uh, if you would live, for example, in in Berlin, right, uh, would your music would be different, mm. right? I think so, Yeah. I feel like I'm constantly influenced by by where I am and the place that I'm in, and I try to be just as open as I can as a as a creative, and absorb kind of everything about the place where I am and and find out about it and and connect with it, but in quite a um a somatic kind of kind of way, and just then just allow uh, whatever kind of comes out to come out but through that real bodily connection. And how your, let's say, how your um, being in um, uh, the fact that you live in Australia, how it shapes uh, to your mind, your music, right? 
or how Australia. Mm. Uh, um, uh, okay, what is Australia role in your music, and and, and how to well, how to listeners can find it? Then? Yeah, that I that's a question that I've often asked myself, and and um, I think for me it is about place. I guess it's also a cultural thing. Like I find when I have travelled and and you know been to different countries and studied in different places that the aesthetic of music is is quite different and I find that the aesthetic of of music in Australia is often quite open and I, I think a lot of Australian composers are influenced by landscape that's been a really strong part of of historically of Australian composers and that's certainly something that that I'm influenced in but I'm interested in in exploring that in a way that is is a new way and a different way and is a way that kind of takes in to account the not just the natural landscapes but also the man-made landscapes and and our histories of us as a society so I that's kind of come into play in some of my pieces where where I might take a political um idea or a historical practice that's happened and and highlight that in my music so it kind of comes from both a, a natural world but also a kind of a social and a, a human historical perspective as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, if you would be a, a male would your music would be different right um i don't know <laughs> i mean I, I I can't really answer that question because I can only write as my lived experience as as who I am today. So, yeah. And um, what is your process of uh, of uh, of writing music? Uh, how you start? I, what kind of stages? Yeah, I sure. I often start with a with a macro, like a, a kind of a grand concept, I guess. Um, so for my latest orchestral piece that I wrote, I was really interested in the in Neolithic goddess mythology. And that started off as a, um, me doing quite a lot of research and then surrounding myself with symbology um, to do with that. But then it also uh, morphed into my connection with place and, and where I live and, and who I am. And so for me, I often start with these kind of big kind of grand ideas and then I try to just either research it a lot or just surround myself with ideas from that period and try to almost let it kind of go into me by osmosis. And then at some point, once I start writing the music, it might be through a process of improvisation or it might be through recording some sounds and playing with them or often I'm writing words like uh might be uh like and I often like think about textures whether that's grains or whether uh it might be particular sounds so like from the environment like a clicking sound or or a sound that sounds like the wind or these kind of uh concepts that will start to reveal themselves to me as sonic properties and then once I start to kind of map those with words then the music tends to kind of come and I start with kind of more gestural sweeps and ideas and thinking of sounds uh, for instance in this orchestral piece I was quite interested in this concept of a deep spiral so I really wanted to play with the lower registers of the of the orchestra and how I could use that to its greatest advantage um, and then once I start actually writing notes on the page I find that the piece then starts to kind of reveal itself to me and I I get these kind of sections which then I kind of piece together but I always have a big kind of quite a big map of of the piece from when I start so I have an idea of you know how long it needs to be and and these kind of over overarching structures like for me that's always a really important part of my music regardless of what piece I'm writing is is to have this kind of coherence as a whole piece so I usually start from that and then kind of work my way in <laughs> and then at some point the piece kind of takes over um, so that's yeah that's the process that I, I tend to employ the most <laughs> 
And um, I noticed that you have been uh, uh, writing some multimedia pieces as well, right? Or you have written some mm. multimedia pieces as well. And what's then the, what's the biggest difference in, in the process if you write, let's say, a multimedia piece where? Mm. I think often when I'm doing a multimedia piece, it, it will be, I, I work a lot more on the computer. If I'm writing a piece for, say, orchestra, it's all pencil and paper <laughs> until I get to the publishing stage. But when I'm doing multimedia works, especially if I'm working with video, then um, I've got to obviously sync to the picture or sometimes the music comes first and then the picture gets synced to that. But I find it more of a, a, a back and forth process and usually it's in collaboration with a visual artist or a director, uh, in which case there's more of their influence on my work as a composer as well. So it's not necessarily just my idea anymore. It becomes a, a combined idea where we're talking about what, what it's about and I'm feeding off visuals that they're providing me and vice versa. Uh, so a piece that I did many years ago called Chromosome with a, a visual artist, Samantha Finn. Um, we worked both ways. So I provided her some music and she did visuals to that and then vice versa. Um, and that worked really well actually as, a, as an overall piece. And it was nice to have those sections that were synced, but it does, I find it influences the way I might make rhythmic decisions, especially when you're syncing to picture. So I feel like especially kind of rhythmic considerations when you're writing without having an image there are, are different um, in terms of like, you know, bars and beats and where things line up and, and it, but I find that interesting because sometimes you're kind of forced into making a decision that you wouldn't necessarily make, but often that can make the music more interesting or lead yes. it in a different direction or force you to kind of find new, new ways and new, new ideas and different ways of working. So, um, but I find it fascinating working in that multimedia space. And in particular, that piece, we worked in full surround with the visuals as well as the audio. So we had the audience sitting in the middle with four screens and then projecting onto the audience. And then the music was in 10 channel sound. So there was, you know, this kind of constant movement and panning around and, and then different sounds coming from different places and really trying to create that full Yes. immersive experience for the audience so that was a lot of fun <laughs> Go ahead. yeah Go ahead. Um, and actually in that piece the the artist Samantha Samantha Finn there was a section where you had to close your eyes she's really interested in when your eyes are closed and you know when the light flickers and but your eyelids are closed and what you see so there was a whole section of the piece where the audience were asked to close their eyes and there was um yeah, you could still see like the images, the way she'd, she'd made them. You could still see the flickering of light behind the eyes. So that was really interesting for me that, um, yeah, that question, I guess, of, of what is it that we're seeing and how can we still see these images and what, what effect does that have and how does that affect our senses when, when our eyes are closed and the way we perceive the sound is obviously different as well in that, in that moment, so... Got it. Mm. And um, right at the beginning, you said that when you introduced, you said that uh, the, uh, the technology plays an important role in your music. And uh, what are, let's say, for you, the most important technological artifacts right? or mm. hardware or software which you use the most in, during the uh, uh, as composer? Yeah, um, I'm really fascinated in connecting acoustic instruments and technology and really seeing using technology as a tool to help create new sound worlds and discover new possibilities with with instruments that you know we've had around for for, for a long time um, so in particular I, I wrote a piece recently for bass recorder uh, lost in the darkness for a virtuoso player here in Australia, Alicia Crossley, and we worked very closely together. Um, 
and just the sound of the bass recorder and it's a fairly quiet instrument so for me to work electronically with that piece it was really about finding all the nuances of the instrument and trying to really capture the essence of that instrument and really enhance it with the electronics and not to lose the organicness of of a player and a performer who who knows their instrument so well and to really work quite collaboratively together to to discover sounds that that we could play with and ways to enhance the instrument so in particular I like to find uh sound like sounds that are often inaudible so lots of kind of air sounds or you know these beating sounds which through amplification are really quite intensified and made a lot more audible for audiences in a way that where we wouldn't normally be able to hear the detail of those sounds in an acoustic setting so through using you know the tools of technology that we have and and using some you know some nice plugins (laughs) with like delays and reverbs and then it almost became it becomes like a duet because you're really kind of amplifying and enhancing and making these sounds last for a lot longer than what they naturally would Um, and then the interplay between that and really being able to create a whole sonic space just from one instrument that was really really fascinating for me and and a lot of fun Um, so there's there's that component like enhancing and and I'm always kind of looking for ways to make the experience uh enjoyable for the for the player as well and for them not to be bound by what the computer's doing for the computer really to to assist them and for them to be able to still play quite naturally and with you know the full expression that they would normally use without having to worry about you know whether they're you know going to miss a beat here or you know to to have that interplay between between the instrument and the performer and I'm also getting quite interested in gestural controllers at the moment as well. So I've got a couple of those um, Genki wave rings, the Bluetooth rings, and I've been playing quite a lot with those in my kind of live uh, improvised electronic practice and how, and that for me was really nice to have that kind of organic way of of playing the computer in a, in a way where you're not just kind of sitting at the keyboard and pressing buttons. It was, it, yeah, it feels really nice. It feels a lot more like actually playing an instrument. So for me, that's the most fascinating kind of aspect of technology is, is how we can enhance what we're able to do as, as humans. <laughs> and what kind of software are you using? Uh, do you use Macs? Um, or I do use Macs. So I use Macs MSP and then sometimes I just, if I just need to do something quick and easy, I'll use, I use Ableton, um, Pro Tools a lot, and then quite a lot of kind of plugins. So I'll use the GRM plugins quite a bit. Um, yeah, some of the, um, yeah, but they're probably the main ones that I use for electroacoustic work. And do you, um, uh, do you write code as well or do you code? I don't or- usually write code, no, <laughs> I don't. I, I, I do all the visual kind of programming in Max. I don't do the coding so much. Um, yeah, I guess I'm more more of a um, a traditional composer in that sense, where I, li- I like to you know kind of write the notes with pencil and paper, and then work out what it is that I want the patch to do to to kind of help me realize uh, whatever the vision is, whether it's a multimedia thing, whether it's just creating a, a like a um, a playback kind of patch or whatever to enable me to kind of mix live or for the player to be able to kind of trigger specific things throughout the score um yeah so I'm not so much kind of doing coding myself at the moment um I did do a piece with Sydney Dance Company last year where we had uh I was we were using motion tracking and blob tracking so we had a camera above the space and the dancers were moving around and triggering different sounds in different elements but again I was using kind of the um like the objects in Max that yeah, I wasn't kind of writing my own objects. I was using ones that other people have spent many, <laughs> many years creating. So it's, um yeah, it's a lot of fun. There's so many possibilities. <laughs> and um, what's your relationship with indigenous music, right? Or music you know, of... Yeah. At- user, uh, this musical language incorporate not or... Um, I- I don't f- 
feel like it's my place to kind of um, use cultural music that's not my culture. Um, but I'm certainly very interested in Indigenous music and I find I find it fascinating. And I'm, I do a lot of reading. For instance, I've, I've been reading this book called Song Spirals and that was quite influential in my thinking for my orchestral piece that I wrote. Um, in particular, you know, hearing about the way song is so embedded into culture and stories and the, the whole way of kind of living and being and existing in the world. For me, that was probably very um, revelatory, I think, and, and to me made sense because that feels like the path I've been kind of trying to explore, like what's my connection with this place and 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 the you know the animals and the trees and the people and and everything and that concept of of everything being part of country and that it's not just um one thing it's everything and how it all works together so that's quite influential in the way I approach my own compositional style I think um yeah but I certainly find find it it's such a rich culture and I feel like we don't know enough about it. Um, but I think we're, 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 we're learning more and more all the time, which, which is, can only be a, a, a wonderful thing. So. Um, looking back uh, on yourself, right. Uh, how your music uh, changed in the last 10 years? Yeah, I think I've written a lot more of it. <laughs> so I think I've got, got better at it but I think also and and I probably would say this in another 10 years that I feel like you know in my music 10 years ago was was kind of naive in a way or had a naivety to it which which I don't dislike either like I quite like that about it um and I feel like probably in another 10 years I think I'll be a different person and a different composer again and that for me it's always a process of self-discovery so I think the more I, I learn about myself and the more my music evolves and changes. So I think it's going to be a constant journey throughout my life. Um, but yeah, probably that kind of, that naivety. My music was a, a lot more tonal, I think, and a lot more kind of perhaps influenced by, by minimalism, say 10 years ago. But I've always been interested in how do we merge you know, I've also been, you know, I was really interested in 12 tone music. And, and so some of my pieces use 12 tone, but then also a lot of mode modes. And I was already experimenting with how to bring all these kind of disparate ideas or schools of thought together in my music. And so I feel like that has kind of I've found a place that feels more comfortable for that now, I think. So it's, I think it's developed and it's changed in that respect. Good. And uh, you as a composer, right? What is your, the biggest fear? What is the uh, good uh, mm -hmm. composer fear? I think my biggest fear is not being able to compose. <laughs> so... I've kind of engineered my life to be to, to to make that possible. So that that's my biggest fear is is not being able to do it. And um, this question will come from my friend François Charan. Uh, I asking uh, um, any 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 person who I interview or any composer who I interview, um, why do you still compose? Mm. Well, for me, I I have to. It's kind of an innate um desire that that's something that I just kind of have to do and it's I can't really explain why or how it's just something that I'm drawn to and um when I'm not doing it I get quite depressed actually so it's just become more and more apparent to me that that I need to be doing it and that when I'm not doing it then I'm not as happy <laughs> so it's and I haven't I hadn't always put those two things together but I think it's yeah it's I've, I get quite um, quite anxious and just yeah don't I've, I'm much when I'm working on something and composing I um, I feel a lot more connected to to who I am as a person so for me it's quite an innate need to to do it. Right. 
and I love playing with sound. I mean, what's what's not to love about that? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, to your mind, right? Uh, what are the biggest changes in the last in this century, right? Uh, in, in uh, landscape of contemporary music in Australia, how this uh, contemporary music landscape changed during this century? During the whole century, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I think that there's no longer like kind of schools of of composers anymore. Like it's anything anything goes basically. Um, I don't feel like. I feel like, you know, maybe I don't even like 30, 40 years ago, like there was, you know, a particular composer who was kind of like the lead composer and had a lot of students underneath them and they kind of all wrote, you know, modernist music or, you know, this, there was, and if you weren't writing that particular type of music, then you weren't a real composer. I think that attitude really has has disappeared. That doesn't exist anymore. I think, you know, it's it's quite accepted to to write in any style really and and that there's an, a much more openness I think to, to composing which I I really love I just because I love all music so it's it's great to not feel bound I guess in terms of having to kind of fit a particular mold so I think that's that's been a big change in the last century um, and I think as well, you know, the advent of technology has really changed the way people write music and the way um, the way we listen to music and the sounds that are possible. I think we've had, you know, and there's so much influence from popular culture and that there's a lot of, um, well, there's everything, really. Everything's happening. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing's taboo anymore. So. Yes, yes. Can you give just um, you said right that uh, there are some some due to technological advances, there is a music which is possible only this century, right? Can you just give mm. examples uh, of particular composers or of the types of sounds? Types of sounds or composers, yes, both. Uh, actually, should I just yeah, uh, sure. Well, I think being able to amplify the instrument and to discover, you know, like, you know, all the air sounds that you wouldn't normally have had previously that you can hear when they're amplified and the different, you know, the surfaces of the instrument can really be explored much more fully. Um, instruments can be used in a much more non-traditional way. Um, so I think that's been been a huge advance in terms of, of music. And so one composer who, who I really love, Clara Maida, um, so her, she wrote a piece that I heard at Biffum a number of years ago, an electroacoustic piece. And that was, for me, was really, really fascinating, just the way electronics and, and the instruments were combined to create, you know, something I'd never heard before. It was, yeah, for me, that's, that's really exciting. Good. And, um, how much, uh, let's say, how much is all decriminalizational discourse, right? Which are happening in, or happened in, in some geographies in the world, how much it influenced, uh, let's say, um, or impacted the uh, impacted, uh, landscape of uh, 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 contemporary music in, in, in Australia? Um, so I missed one word right at the start of the question. So the- How, you know, is, is there is some, uh, decolonization, right? Uh, stuff that uh, that there are like colonial periods and, and looking to back what was uh, before and reconstructing or playing with that. Uh, it's uh, this discourse uh, uh, in some geographies becoming uh, in the world becoming more and more, let's say, uh, widespread, right? Or more and more important. And and then the question is, how is this uh, like decolonizational discourse? How it's impacted? Australian new uh, new music or contemporary music scene is it is it something important or um the technolization of or... decolonization I mean decolonization 
let's say more this right. coming back to the roots right uh, um, mm. or this indigenous uh, indigenous uh, uh, music right mm. i think um uh, again i think you know just everything's available isn't it like it's you know we can hear music from anywhere in the world at the click of a button I think it's and that and I think there's also more of a desire to and and an awareness of the importance of of yes. indigenous musics as well yes. so I think that you know that, that is becoming more and more important as it should um but I also think that we're largely influenced by everything that's happening in the world. Yes, and yes. I think, I mean, it's very easy to just kind of be interested in one particular type of music. And I mean, there's so much out there that you could really just go, I'm just going to listen to, to, you know, this particular genre of music. Um, but really there's just so much out there that it just feels like, you know, I could listen to music for every minute of the rest of my life and I still wouldn't have heard it all. You know, it's 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 quite astounding, really. Um, but I do think that that, you know, Bartok did it, didn't he, when he was, was recording music and preserving music that that would never have been heard otherwise if, if it hadn't have been preserved and captured and and then and then he he used that um I think I think that where that I think in Australia where we're starting to kind of realize the importance of of indigenous musics and how in, how important that is culturally and I think that we're, we're you know I think we've only really just scratched the surface of that so I think it's it's a really really important important thing. And um, mm -hmm. uh, let's say uh, contemporary music uh, composers uh, community in Australia is it becoming uh, more gender balanced or or what are the trends in in this century? Um, it is. It's it's slowly <laughs> slowly becoming more gender balanced. Um, it's still. It's uh, still I wouldn't say. Sorry. Yeah. In, no, is it still male dominance? Yeah, yeah, it is still. But it's yeah, there's there's some really amazing initiatives. So there's the Composing Women program at Sydney Conservatorium, which Lisa Lim runs, and um, was set up by Matthew Heinsen originally. So that's had uh, three or four iterations of of composers. So that's starting to really start to shift shift the way things are happening and and a lot more women's voices being heard and there's definitely a bit of a groundswell of that of that happening um yeah so so it is changing definitely but it's been with effort from from people to to make that happen and I think you know the more it happens and and I think just it becomes hopefully the norm just to have have gender parity so and how audience uh, how audience change during the century um well, oh, I mean I I haven't been alive for the all of the century <laughs> so I can't I can't say I are you talking about the just the 21st century or first, just it's oh okay sorry when you say the century I keep thinking you mean like the last 100 years but you actually mean like the last 20 the last 20 years last 20 years okay um so I don't know that I don't know that it's changed that much. So not that I've kind of seen, like I think still similar kind of groups of people go to listen to new music. It seems like a quite a young kind of crowd that are interested in new music, um, but not exclusively young. I think there's some ensembles like Ensemble Offspring that have quite a big following and and a lot of people at their, at their gigs, which is great. So I think there's potentially more people going to things um but then not all the time so sometimes you go to some new music concerts and there's hardly anyone there so I think it just kind of it seems largely ensemble driven I think that that you know people kind of generate audiences or or 
have a bit of a following. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, like it's, we always kind of need bigger audiences for new music. It, it always seems, seems, you know, you don't get the same audiences that you might for, you know, like Beethoven symphonies or for, you know, um, like the Hans Zimmer experience at, at Homebush Stadium or, mm -hmm. or something with, with film music. Uh, so it's all, I mean, much smaller crowds, but it's still, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really feel like it's changed a lot in the, in the last kind of 20 or so years. Is it disappearing? Is the audience disappearing or not? No, no, I don't think they're disappearing. I think it's probably about the same. Yeah. And um, uh, what do you uh, think, what, what will be, or what are, let's say, the main future trends, right? What shapes, how you see the future of, uh, of uh, new uh, contemporary mm. music scene in Australia? And what well, I think, sorry, what's the last and And what shapes, right? Mm. I, I think technology is a huge driver of changes. Um, yeah, there's just so much available to composers now that wasn't available before in terms of technology and um, interaction between visuals and music. I think at the moment I see quite a big drive towards composers integrating kind of more theatrical elements or, you know, thinking about lighting or dramaturgical kind of considerations. I think that's a bit of a shift at the moment. Um, so I think I can see that continuing in the new music space. I mean, it's kind of always been there and, you know, in the dance music scene, it's kind of, kind of been there for a long time, but I think that's really kind of starting to shift more now into new music where people are working more with visuals or adding those kind of, other elements to the performance in a way that enhances the music and I guess it's finding that balance between what's in what is an enhancement and what's a distraction um and what's you know what's something just for the sake of having it there so does it uh, so I feel like that that's going to continue that uh use of visuals or drama or that sense of theatre um, that's happening. I think, I definitely think that that's going to continue because it's about, um, it's about engagement, I guess, like drawing, drawing people in and connecting, connecting them with the music and that helps to, to do that. And it also helps to really create an atmosphere and a, and a space for the music to live as well. Um, yeah, and I think technology is going to continue, like gestural controllers are, you know, becoming a lot more kind of commonplace and, and the, um, yeah, the technologies are getting smaller and smaller. I think it's, you know, it's very, it's really interesting to see where we're going, where we're going to end up with, with where the technology is. And then I know a lot of people are really getting into the whole AI thing at the moment too so that's it'll be interesting to see where that heads in terms of music and how composers use that as a tool um I'm always fascinated fascinated by how composers take uh these new developments in technology and use that as a tool for for generating music mm. and finding new sounds because I guess that's what composers are all about isn't it finding <laughs> finding new and interesting sounds so Hmm. And um, what is the role, right? What is the role? Of, what is the role of contemporary new um, contemporary music in Australian society? I feel like it's contemporary music's job is to explore and push boundaries, make us question ourselves as as humans, and um, yeah. <laughs> they're my they're my big things I guess boundary pushing <laughs> uh, and the last question what would be your free suggestions to younger composers mm. uh, well something actually one of my lecturers said to me many years ago tenacity um, I think that is really important um, that's probably the biggest 
the biggest one. Uh, the second one would be like work ethic and just, you know, always writing and always developing and, and growing as a composer, unless you're like I found in my own practice, unless I'm actually kind of doing, then I'm not kind of discovering and moving forward. And then the third one would be to kind of create a community around you and, and find that community of people that you resonate with, find other composers and musicians and, and find that world. And cause it can be a lonely place sometimes being a composer. So I think, yeah, keeping that community is really important too. So um, Fiona, thank you very much for this interview. Oh, you're very welcome, Sandra. Thank you.